Welcome to the Blazer's Edge podcast. I'm Tara and this is Joe. I'm back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we are the fanalists. And we are here to open our hearts and spill our guts and talk about everything that we love about the Portland Trailblazers and the NBA. Are you ready to talk some basketball, Joe? I am. I'm like so out of the loop. So I'm ready for you to talk some basketball and bring me back in. Uh, it's obviously far away from everything that's happening. And unfortunately, the NBA draft um, happens real early in the day up here in Alaska. So I'm always at work and I've been missing out a lot and I'm just so stoked to get caught up and back on track. Well, I'm looking forward to telling you all about it. I actually went to the Blazers Edge NBA draft party that was at the Spirit of 77 um, on draft night. It was super fun. Peter Sampson, one of the writers and the host of the Blazers Edge radio show, he did a live show from Spirit of 77. And I've never been there before. And there were a lot of people there. And it was super fun. It felt like really, you know, like I was in the middle of, you know, some big event because it's like all these Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been there before, but the tables are like all lined up looking at the super big screen. And so it kind of felt like had a little bit of that like war room feeling to it. And uh, so we had, you know, ESPN up and we had Peter talking and Dan Morang was there and they were talking about what they thought was going to happen. It was fun. It's it, it like really felt like an event. So I'm happy to report to you what that event was like. And we can just, I'm looking forward to talking about just some of the things that are going on in second season. Cause I don't know about you, but I love second season every year. uh, I, I enjoy even it it more just trying to figure out what the heck is going to happen during the draft and free agency and all that. I mean, I don't always pay a ton of attention during this time of year, no matter if I'm in Portland or not, or if I'm like, tuned in or not uh because i don't know i just never do i do if if there's something big for portland Mm -hmm. if something big is coming up or they think we're going to make some major moves but otherwise i'm not really super in tune this time of year but i'm more shocked i want to go back for one second that you've never been to spirit of 77 no no this is the first time for anything you know me i don't go out a ton so I love that place. (laughs) I usually watch, if I'm not at a game, I watch it at home just because I like to, uh, you know, look things up and have fast internet so I can find out what's going on and look at stats during the game and uh, be able to, you know, jump up and get my own food and not have to like wait for people to bring me stuff. So I usually like to watch games for myself, but I can see why people really enjoy going there and watching. Yeah, yeah, well... I love it. I wish I had been at this fun draft party that you speak of. But since I wasn't, I'm going to need you to help me out here. All righty. So first of all, can you please tell me, and you know, I don't follow college ball either. So people, all the, everyone up here knows that I love basketball. All my friends, all the bartenders, all the restaurant servers, like they all know. And so they've maybe it's that LaMarcus Aldridge Jersey you wear everywhere. Everywhere. (laughs) I never take it off. Um, They, so they're always, they're all asking me how I feel about our picks. And I'm like, guys, you know, I don't follow college ball. So I I have zero opinion thus far. And I was last night, I was going to look it up and research some stuff and kind of get to know the players. And then I thought it would be way more fun and way less work to have you (laughs) tell me. (laughs) Well, cause you know, I was all over it. And the way, the way I approach the draft is there's just, there's too many guys to keep track of. I just, I can't. I mean, I tried to watch college ball as much as I could this year. I actually saw a couple of Gonzaga games, which is good because we got a guy from Gonzaga, but really it's just kind of overwhelming to me. And my hat is off to people who like follow college ball closely because there is so much going on and you like, unless they're your team, it's, I, I gotta think it's hard to keep track of these guys because so right? they're like barely there. I mean, a lot it of guys are so there for like a year. Yeah. Oh, and I mean, you know me, I work in the summer, I work six days a week and 10 to 12 hours a day. So it's, I mean, I just don't have time. That's 12 other hours in the day. You could be learning about college ball jokes. You're right. But I'm, I choose to eat and sleep and walk my dog. So, uh, (laughs) you know, I figured we could start with Zach Collins and you can just tell me who the heck he is and what's he like and how you think he's going to do. So you want to start there? Okay. Yeah, sure. 
So um, one of the things to know about uh, draft night for if anybody, um, you know, wasn't following it closely is going into draft night, you know, we had the picks 15, 20 and 26. And so everybody was like, what's going to what are people going to do? What are people going to do? Are they going to you know trade them? Are they going to trade packages? And, you know, I think a lot of people were expecting that they might use some of those picks to sweeten some deals with uh, some of our players who have uh, high contracts that um, they might want to trade away and that they would throw in a draft pick. But that didn't happen. So coming into draft night, we still had all three picks and people still thought, you know, that you know night, the night was young. They were like, what are the Trailblazers going to do? And uh, lo and behold, there was a trade on uh, draft night. The Blazers traded number 15 and 20 and they traded it up for number 10. So okay. that, that was a surprise. That was exciting. There was like a big murmur in the room. They were like, yes, this is exciting. This is going to be exciting. And then in the room, when they announced that uh, the Trailblazers were going to get Zach Collins, people were kind of like really underwhelmed. There wasn't a big like, you know, I there was a way bigger cheer when they announced the trade of picks than there was when they actually announced the name of the player. Oh, so really? For whatever reason, people who happened to be gathered there that night, I don't know if people just didn't know a lot about him or if they thought the Blazers were going to be taking somebody else or what. But um, there wasn't a, you know, a huge outburst of joy <laughs> when Zach Collins was was selected. But that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, people don't think that he can be an interesting choice for the Trailblazers. So here's a little bit about him. Um, okay. he, he's a 19 year old freshman from Gonzaga. He's Gonzaga's first ever one and done. So uh, every other player who's gone from Gonzaga to the um, uh, to the NBA was there for longer than a year. Do you happen to know off the top of your head any other of the notable Gonzaga um, alumni? I mean, absolutely not. There's a couple. There's some good ones. John Stockton <laughs> okay. was there, oh. went there, and his son also went there. Kelly Olynyk went to Gonzaga, and uh, Damas Sabonis also went to um, Gonzaga. But they were all there longer than Zach Collins. Oh, um, okay. Zach grew up in Las Vegas, and he went to a, a fancy sports-oriented prep school called Bishop Gorman, where uh, he was a key part of a team that won four consecutive state championships. He, uh, This was interesting. He also played three-on-three -three competitively. He went to the 2015 FIBA U18 World Championships, where he played in three-on-three, -three, which, I don't know, I thought that was interesting. The yeah. Olympics just added three-on-three. So that's something that he enjoys enough to have really pursued it at a high level. Um, another fun fact is one of his teammates on his three and three team was Peyton Pritchard from who I believe is from West Lynn. So um, West Coast connections. Sure. Yeah. Which is different because we have so many guys from the Boston area. It's kind of exciting to get somebody from somewhere. Different. <laughs> uh, he was a McDonald's All-American and he was he played in the All American game and w had what I consider a really efficient game. He only played for twelve minutes, but he had nine points, six rebounds, three assists, and two steals. Um, you know, I didn't compare that directly to anybody else, but it seems to me usually when I'm looking up stats from the All American games, like it's uh, there's some guys who you know only get like a couple of points and maybe a rebound or something, but that seemed like a a pretty impressive stat line for especially only twelve minutes of play. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, in 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah 9.6 rebounds, 3 assists, 2 steals. Uh, he was Nevada's Gatorade Player of the Year. And the thing to know about Zach Collins, I think, that people are really talking about is he never started a single game in college. So he was the number 10 pick in the uh, in the draft, and he never started a single game in college. That's alarming to me. <laughs> Well, here's why. The reason that he never started uh, is because he played behind fifth-year senior uh, Primik Karnowski. I'm not quite sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Karnowski was a Polish center, 300 pounds, 7'1". He's a giant beast of a man, and a fantastic player, and somebody you know who'd been in the rotation for a long time. He actually injured his back his junior year, but came back uh, his senior year and was a really important part of the game. So one thing to know about Zach Collins is you know, he was a very uh, high, you know, he was a big recruit um, and he came in and he 
eagerly and happily accepted a role, a key bench role. And he really liked his role as the number one guy off the bench. Like he was totally okay with it. He didn't, there was no, no problem for him um, to play behind somebody else. So I'm, I'm still shocked. I mean, you know, I don't like rookies anyway, because I think that it takes them so long to make the transition and you never know what they're really going to bring on an NBA court, but to also then say that they've never even experienced the pressure of starting in a college game. Um, is that not a red flag for you? I don't know. I mean, after reading about him, I understand why it makes more sense to me. And when you see how productive he was in the minutes that he just, that he did play, I think you'll uh, get a little bit better of an idea about why he was a high pick. And the other thing to say about his, the uh, picking him is I, I looked at a whole bunch of mock drafts. I looked at like, you know, 15 mock drafts or whatever that I somebody else compiled. Thank God it wasn't me because I would have lost my mind trying to do that. But I looked at a whole bunch of drafts and it was, um, you know, he was he was chosen like right there in in the region that most people thought he was going to go. Most people thought he was going to go about 10 to 13 a lot of people had Detroit taking him at 12. So it wasn't like the Blazers took him like completely out of the blue. It wasn't like they chose somebody that, you know, everybody thought was going to go 20 and we took him at 10. It looks like, you know, it was, you know, selecting him uh, was right in line with where other people were considering taking him or at least thought his value would be. Okay, well, I'm I'm just here to say that I'm alarmed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, well, I don't... So this makes me uncomfortable. Um, so I guess, I, I mean, what what do you think that he's going to bring then? What do you think that he, how do you think he's going to help us? Because right now I'm feeling nervous. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, and it, it is it is definitely odd. It, he only played uh, average 17 minutes a game. During that time, he shot 65%. He got about 5.3 shots a game. He... Uh, got 5.9 rebounds, 1.8 blocks, and 10 points. But again, that's only in 17 minutes a game. So he was, again, pretty, I think, pretty efficient with the minutes that he did get. He was a five-star recruit who came in, like I said, without complaining. Coaches really liked his attitude on offense. He brings, he is an efficient scorer. He is listed as a forward center, but I really think he's going to play center. Oh, by the way, he is uh, about seven feet tall and I think 230. So he's a slender uh, mobile dude. That's so dang skin. That's what Jimmy Butler weighs. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a slender guy. Um, so the highlights that I watched uh, featured a lot of three point shooting, um, although he didn't take a whole he didn't. Uh, take a lot so in the highlights they put in a lot of nice three-point shoots shots but he really didn't take that many um but he is very quick you know he's light on his feet he's able to get up and down the floor both on defense and in offense he converted 70 percent of his shots around the rim so he's efficient at oh dang around the rim That's yeah good defensive you know like most rookies okay here's the thing here's my beef with people who talk about the draft is that um a lot of people are like well we need defensive players we need defensive players and my question is how many guys who are in the draft are really fully developed defensive players it seems to me like that is one of the harder things if not the hardest thing to develop and it's like you can't just like they're not growing on trees you know you can't just like i'm gonna go get a defensive player and like you're gonna just get one that's like yeah does everything that you want him to do and plays defense so um he of course you know has some defensive holes um but i was focusing actually on his potential uh again he's quick he can get out on the perimeter quickly so, you know, as the league becomes a three-point shooting league and we need to de defend the perimeter, he's at least mobile enough to get out there, although his ability, you know, to position himself correctly is something that still needs development, but he's at least can get there. He uh, has really good timing for his blocks. So I watched a lot of highlights again of, of his blocks and not a lot of them occurred around the rim. So initially when I saw that he did average a lot of blocks, I thought he was a rim protecting center, but he's really not getting most of them at the rim. A lot of them he's getting away from the rim, like in the paint where he's just timing himself really well. Um, 
another thing that I noticed in his highlights is he does a very good job of keeping his arms straight up. <laughs> Draft Express mentioned that he has an advanced understanding of verticality. So I thought that would make you happy. That does make me happy. <laughs> I do like that. The the last thing to know about like his positives is that he came up huge in the final four. Um he that that performance a lot of people say he he was the reason that they won that game and you know as as you know Gonzaga went to the finals and they lost in the finals of the NCAA tournament so one thing that he has shown is that uh he's performed really well under pressure under huge pressure um so I like that about him too so again although he's not like the star of the team he came up huge in the final four game against South Carolina he had 14 points, 13 rebounds, six blocked shots. And he hit a really important three that stopped a South Carolina 16-0 run. And just in general, at the end of the game, his play was clutch. So he doesn't take a lot of three-point shots, you said, but he does have range. He does, yes. Um, He only takes like half a game, so he's not taking a lot, but he was shooting well over 40% on the ones that he did. Oh, he which shot, is good. Yeah, he shot almost 48% from three, but he only took like averaged half of a three per game. Gotcha. So you said there's some holes defensively. Do you have any other concerns or things that you would consider like risks with him? There is the, um, you know, there, there's this, he's not very big. Uh, so he's seven feet tall and he has a seven, one wingspan. So a lot of guys who are seven feet tall have a larger wingspan than that. So, uh, one of the knocks on him is that he does, even though he's tall, he doesn't have quite as much length. So if you compare him to like Nurkic, who, um, you know, Nurkic's arms are an inch longer. Myers are a couple inches longer. Ed Davis even who actually is shorter than Zach has a longer wingspan. So his arms for reaching are not, you know, as, as great as some people uh, wish that they would be. He also falls for fakes a lot as, you know, rookies do as young players do. So we're going to see a lot of him going for, you know, uh, falling for uh, pump fakes and stuff. He gets in foul trouble you know, another one that's like not a giant surprise. So I think, um, those, those are kind of the risks that we're looking at. Okay. So on a scale of one to 10, what do you think of the pick overall? Um, I think with where the blazers are right now, I'm not really in win now mode. I'm into player development. I'm just, I'm about taking our time because there's some other teams who just kind of like are light years ahead of us in terms of um you know being able to win a championship so i don't i don't think we needed to bring in some i think it's okay that we bring in somebody who uh is gonna need some work and i think i believe neil olshay neil olshay said that that uh, zach collins was somebody they had their eye on all along um, and I believe that because I think, you know, that was why they traded up because they wanted to make sure they can get him. He's regarded as the best center, if not or one of the best, if not the best center in this year's drafts. And like I said, he's he's all in line. So I'm not super excited about it, but I'm fine with it. So I guess I would say like on a scale of one to ten, I'm like a seven. OK, but that's pretty good. That's a like that's a hopeful. There's a lot of potential here kind of rating. So. I'm okay with that. I mean, I I read plenty of articles. And of course, again, during around draft time, everything is like, they're the greatest player ever, or, you know, they're a disaster. Like there's never anywhere in the middle. Um, I did read a brief headline of where like experts graded the Blazers as one of the best draft nights that there was. Like they got a they got a really good rating or grading from experts around the NBA, so that gives me hope as well. <laughs> That's a really good point. I mean, you know, I like after there was like you know not a lot of excitement about drafting him, um, and you know um, some people thought you know he's too young, he's too you know he's too much of a sieve on defense, he's too small, he doesn't his arms are too short. I took a, a look at those at those national rankings, and you're right. I mean, people thought that we did a good job. So, you know, taking a step back 
it looks like yeah you know it, it it could it could pan out well all right so the other guy is do you, is it caleb swanigan or swanigan i think it's swanigan i'm not quite sure okay so um, tell me about him okay so he has a really interesting uh backstory and i encourage everybody who hasn't already to read up about him because he is somebody who has overcome a ton in his life including um homelessness through the age of 13 and um really pretty serious obesity a uh, family he has a family history of obesity and when he was 13 years old and um in 8th grade he was 6 foot 2 and he weighed 360 pounds Oh my gosh. Yes. So he his whole for the beginning of his life, he like I said he experienced homelessness. His father was an addict. His mother had six kids. He was the youngest. They spent a lot of time bouncing back and forth between Utah and Indiana looking for safety and stability for their family. And when he was 13 years old, his older brother um uh, connected him with a guy named Roosevelt Barnes who was an AAU coach and a sports agent and uh, Roosevelt Barnes adopted Caleb Swanigan and took care of him. And at that point, like I said, he was 13 years old, six foot two, and he weighed 360 pounds. And in order to get him healthy and because he, the kid loved basketball so much, uh, Mr. Barnes started him on, um, you know, a program to get healthy, which included wow. basketball and, you know, serious training and diet and exercise. Dang. So, yeah, there are some many, many articles about him um, uh, on the Internet, you know, from ESPN, uh, Sports Illustrated, even People Magazine. Like, lots of people have been uh, really compelled by his story. So, anyway, but, but we haven't really talked about him as a basketball player. But one thing that we can see right off is that he is an incredibly hard worker. So, you know, starting... When he was 13 years old and being 360 pounds, by the time he was a senior in high school, he was a McDonald's All-American. He played in the Nike Hoop Summit, and he was Indiana's Mr. Mr. Basketball. Oh, wow. So, I mean, just let that sink in. Like, a teenager accomplished that through hard work and dedication to his craft. After weighing 360 pounds. Yes, exactly. He's now about 6'9 and 250 he so he comes from Purdue. He came out of um, he came out his he was gonna come out his freshman year. He participated in the combine, got feedback, and decided to re enroll for another year in Purdue. So I always have a soft spot for those guys too, um, because I it, it tells me that they're like they're really thoughtful and serious about um, about their craft. Yeah. And, incredibly like if you like if you go and look at his numbers between his freshman and sophomore year he improved in every single category like by a lot in his body i mean it's really outstanding so he went from shooting 46 percent to 52 percent he went from eight shot attempts to 12 shot attempts his three-point shooting went from 29 percent to 45 percent um and he takes about two and a half threes per game um he's a good free throw shooter also so was zach collins by the way um let's see his assists went up from 1.8 to 3 per game his rebounds went up from 8.3 to 12.5 per game his points went up from 10.2 per game to 18.5 um he did increase his personal fouls and turnovers per game but if you look at it per possession they actually went down slightly so i just love how much he improved from one mm -hmm. year to the other i mean he yeah, those, obviously some of those are big jump he obviously works super hard and people in purdue love him um his nickname is biggie which he got from his family so he goes by biggie swan again and so there's like all kinds of articles about biggie that are just they're just a pleasure to read because people loved watching him so we got our own little version of boogie, boogie. <laughs> yeah we have biggie <laughs> biggie <laughs> just kidding. i hadn't thought about that that's great <laughs> so um what are the highlights of what you think he'll bring to our team like how do you think he'll fit in or or best 
best okay. benefit us. So again, hard work. That's going to be really important. Uh, he's really strong and he's got lo- really long arms. He's a good scorer. He's a good passer. Um, he uh, improved from the perimeter a lot from his freshman to sophomore year. Um, he is quite slow, which we'll go over and when we go back to uh, the risks that we have with him. He got slow, but it's funny because I watched a bunch of his highlights and he's really good at the trailing three because <laughs> he's slower than everybody getting <laughs> back down. But yeah. man, he can pop, plop himself right at the top of that three just in time to get the pass from the point guard and just nail it. So that's funny. He, he made the most of it. He is an excellent rebounder. He had four games where he had more than 20 rebounds. That's insane. Yeah, he really knows how to box out and use his and use his size. There's a really great article by Mark Titus, who's not my favorite author because he's the guy who wrote the book about Evan Turner. Um, oh but he, yeah, he wrote a, an article about uh, Biggie and uh, just basically talked about how again how hard he worked and how he wears his opponents out. Like, because he never stops. Like, he goes for every ball. Like, every play, he's engaged from the moment the play starts until the whistle blows or it goes out of bounds or whatever. So, um... And how how tall did you say he was again? He's 6'9". Six 6'9". Nine. Six nine. Okay. I think physically, he's he's uh, kind of like Noah Vonley. Um, which makes me think that... Uh, and also, you know, Zach Collins is you know, could be, even though he's not as heavy, you know, he's kind of a Myers Leonard type replacement in terms of, you know, I think they wanted him to come in and stretch the floor. So I kind of think that Zach Collins and uh, Caleb Swanigan are potential replacements for um, Noah or, and, and Myers, or maybe Ed Davis, who are some of the, you know, Ed Davis is somebody that both Noah and Ed Davis are guys who are on the last year of their contract. So if they walked away next year, we will have had these two players around for an entire year and if need be ready to step in. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, Sure. So what's your what's your rating on a scale of one to ten for this guy? Well, considering where they are right now, I'm perfectly happy with it. I mean, I would rank it really high, like an eight or a nine, because uh, at the 26 pick, I think it's totally fine, fine to um, take a gamble. And I think. Um, he, you know, character wise, I think he'll be a good fit. I think he'll be, you know, I, I think I've talked about before how I love it when there's new guys on the floor because it makes everybody else have to work a lot harder. And I think he's somebody that is going to, um, uh, help everybody improve just by the fact of, you know, they're going to have to be helping him learn the game and they're going to have to play harder, pay more attention to where they are. And I always, I like that. So I think it's great. Um, and I think like once he gets to the NBA, I think the NBA trainers are really going to help him, um, you know, because he still struggles with his weight. He's still, um, you know, he's never going to be, a, you know, a live guy. <laughs> he struggles with <laughs> his weight. He doesn't jump very high. Um, he's not very fast, but I think NBA trainers can help him at least get better on all those things. He, he's probably not going to be elite in any of those categories, I don't think, but they'll help him get better. He sounds just like me, a little overweight, not very fast, can't jump very high. (laughs) But with NBA trainers, you can really show a lot of improvement. Yeah, see, there you go. (laughs) So I don't know from how I described them, what do you think the, how do you think they sound like they would fit in with the Blazers? Yeah, I mean, sure. I, I think both of them have, from what you say, some potential to add to the team. I just... I kind of just always think in my brain that the first year is going to be a wash for these players because we got really, really, really lucky with like Damian Lillard. Most, most rookies don't come out acting and playing like that. They're not immediate contributors that can completely control what's happening out on the floor. So I don't, I guess I don't really have a huge opinion on this. I'm like, great. Sure. I don't think you're going to detract from the team. I'm not a hundred percent sure how much you're going to add to the team yet either, but we'll see how you do over this first year and with the limited minutes that you'll play and then moving forward when we've got some free agents and, or we make some trades and we have holes pop up in our team, perhaps they'll be able to plug those holes and fill in. So I, I, I guess 
I'm pretty neutral about it so far. I agree with you 100% about uh, Damian Lillard. I mean, Damian Lillard, A, came in completely ready for the NBA, and he also came into a situation where there was room for him to do that. For sure. Like, we needed that position. <laughs> we yeah. needed it immediately. So, like, they handed the keys to the car to him when he came yeah. in. And that's, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen with these Which guys. Which I'm sure, like, totally ticked off LaMarcus Aldridge. But, um but he he was what we needed and he provided that immediately there was just almost zero hesitation about him as a player at all so you just don't come across that very often and i'm grateful that we were lucky enough to get it with him and i think you know these guys are just a little less hyped and they have less experience so they're just they're not going to come out the gate like that and we'll just have to see how they do over this first year or two of being in the league. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my motto for like calendar year 217 has been, it's fine. Like, <laughs> that's how I feel about this. It's fine. It doesn't knock my socks off. I can talk myself into, you know, uh, believing that they are good guys and that they were picked in reasonable places. Like, I'm really glad that they didn't take a flyer on somebody that was like, what like why did you pick that guy when everybody else thought he was going to go at number 30 and you picked him at 10 you know i'm glad that they picked people like within you know the realm of where it looked like they needed to go sure well you brought up lamarcus yeah yeah i was gonna say i'm pretty neutral about these two but you know what i'm not neutral about lamarcus yeah oh my so gosh. Um, that seems to have died down quite a bit, but like people were all over asking me, what does Joe think about the rumor that the Marcus is coming back to Portland? So tell I, the like, people what you think. I started crying. I, I mean, I was like, I, first of all, I was on my way to, I, people don't, probably don't know quite what I do, but it's, I just stand in a booth all day and I sell tours to people and it's ridiculously irresponsible of me to live this life that I live because I have no responsibility. I shouldn't say irresponsible. I have no responsibility. I have like the easiest job in the world and I I could just sit in my booth and shoot the breeze with my friends all day long. Right. But I'm sitting in a booth all day and I have to carry these big heavy signs to and from work. And so it's a little bit tedious. And then I have to be on all day long because at any moment anyone can walk by and buy a tour for me and stuff like that. So I always like begrudgingly head down to the docks carrying these big old heavy signs and stuff. And I got a little jingle on my phone and I looked down and it was the update that um, the Blazers would be interested in reuniting with him. It was an update direct from Bleacher Report or something. So I basically dropped everything, and I had these big, heavy signs that I carry, and I lifted them up over my head, and I started running around in circles, and I was, like, shaking the signs, and I was yelling, and all these people that sit and listen to me talk all day long, so they're already, like, they don't want to hear more from me are like, Oh great. Like what? this is all we're going to hear about for the rest of the day. And I was almost in tears. And I mean, I was just so excited. Um, I, I don't honestly think that it's quite that likely, but yeah. Do I, do I think he's coming back? No. Do I want him back? Heck yes, I do. I mean, come on. Do I think other players are more valuable to chase than him? Yeah. Do I think that the Blazers are in the position to acquire those other more valuable players like Anthony Davis, for example? No. Like, come on. We're just, we're not going to ever be in line for those big heavy hitters. So the idea of having someone back that I feel is a solid contributor and who is always underrated for what he can actually do and who already knows our system, who already knows our coach, who already knows our players. I mean, of course I would want him back. Not to mention, I just adore him. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people keep asking me, like, why do you want him back? And of, it's not super rational, but it's very m emotional for me. It will always boil down to the fact that he's my favorite player and why he's my favorite player. And it's because he just focuses. He works hard. He even said he stays off of social media in the playoffs because he doesn't want to be in his own head about how the media was killing him because he only really performed well in game one and then he just kind of fell off in the next three games. 
Um, and he didn't want to hear all that. He didn't want it to affect him or his game. He just, he, I, I've said it time and time again, all he cares about is what's happening on the pine. He doesn't care about everything else. And that's so rare in this day and age where it's all about the shoe contract or the commercial or what the media is saying or Twitter wars or whatever. And he just doesn't care. All he wants to do is, is to do his best on the court every day. And I think that's a really, really valuable asset to have. So yeah, I want him back. Okay. I have a couple follow-up questions. First of all, first thing um, that uh, you should know is that I did go on Twitter to try to figure out like what people were thinking about that. And there was a lot of people saying, you know what? Enough time has passed. We're kind of annoyed with how it all went down, but we would take him back basically saying, you know, we, it's not like we're going to be like at the airport waiting for him to like land, but we're not going to like make it hard for him to be here. There were a lot of people who had that, that feeling. Um, but you know, one of the, a lot of the talk when he left Portland was about how he wasn't going to uh, share, he didn't want to share the spotlight with Damian Lillard and he wanted to be, you know, wanted it to be his team and Damian Lillard was here and they'd um, turn the team over to him. How do you think now in hindsight, he might feel about that? Or how do you think, you know, after having been away for a couple of years, how do you think that the two of them could work together? First of all, I don't think that LaMarcus is, objective has ever been to be the only person in the spotlight. And if that were the case, he would not have gone to the Spurs. The Spurs are all about sharing the ball. The Spurs are all about um, equal responsibility, which is kind of why I I find it hasty that the Spurs are even talking about trading him because their style was never, or their intention was never to just feed LaMarcus and have him be the number one guy. It just so happened that in the playoffs with Kawhi and Parker both out, that that's how it worked out. And that's not an easy task for him to take on after not being expected to fulfill that role the entire season. They are all about equal contributions and sharing the ball. And so I don't think LaMarcus went to the Spurs with any intention of I am going to be the go-to guy and the only go-to guy. And when he did become the only go-to guy because of Kawhi and Parker both out, of course the Warriors were going to make for damn sure that they he didn't get anything done. He was their key target. So for them to, to say, like, oh, he didn't produce as well as he did in Portland and we're not sure he's fitting as well, I just feel like that's a little hasty on their part. That's a little side note because, again, the point here is I don't think he left to be their number one guy. I think I think if he came back and he's in the same mentality of I just want to focus and do what's best for the team and I just want to win and concentrate on what's happening on the court, you're looking at having Dame, CJ, Aldridge, and Nurkic on the floor. And I don't know any basketball world where that's not a pretty dynamite lineup. I mean, you're going to get the strong driving and long range shooting from the guards. You're going to have a strong presence in the paint with Nurkic. And then you've got the mid range covered by LaMarcus. I mean, you, you almost become unstoppable because you've got every piece of the court covered and LaMarcus can play great defense, which is another component that everyone keeps complaining about with us. It's and they all could work well together. I mean, he already knows how to play with Dame and CJ so I would absolutely adore it if he came back to us, for sure. Who do you think would be the fifth starter in that rotation? Uh, so we got Damon, CJ, at yeah. one and two. We got Nurkic and LaMarcus at, at four, four and, and five. five. I mean, you've got a myriad of guys that you could plug in there. Perhaps Aminu steps down. Perhaps Mo, you know, because... Amino Amino is pretty versatile actually. I feel like he can he can fill many many positions, but I would assume that it would be Amino or Mo depending on their production. I don't know. It's just No, I, I think I, people I think... are giving Aldridge a bad rap when you've got to remember that um I, it was ESPN that said something about like um how well he fit in with the Spurs and how he made the transition of Tim Duncan leaving so smooth. Um, it made him, 
it he again he never gets the recognition he deserves and this particular espn correspondent was saying that it was he made them very successful without getting much recognition so for people to take his performance in the playoffs which again i think is not a fair judgment of him and to say like well now the spurs are saying he's not fitting in well and he's not producing as well as he did in portland so maybe we'll just trade him i'm like hell yeah give him back give him back because with us you know you're talking about averaging 24 points a game and almost 10 rebounds or something. I can't quite remember what his stats were. I remember it was like 24 points a game. And that's the kind of production that I would absolutely love to see and have back. Yeah, 24 points per game out of a a power forward would be awesome when you come to think about it. And, you know, I really saw parallels, especially in the finals, with what happened to LaMarcus in Portland. Because when LaMarcus came to Portland, it was going to be him and Brandon Roy and Greg Oden. And it was never going to just be... LaMarcus Aldridge he was always the third you know one of three who were going to take the team into the future and as the other two fell off due to injury LaMarcus was left holding the bag and that was kind of like a microcosm of what happened in the final or in the in the playoffs with him he lost Kawhi and Parker and again he was left holding the bag and he was never meant to be I you know I never thought that he was meant really to be the go-to guy. I thought he was meant to be a part of a system like you were saying. Um, I think he's a go-to guy. I don't think he's the mm go-to guy. Mm -hmm. And I think he's perfectly fine with that. Yeah. Well, and I think what happened is I think the the Spurs are trying to um, make room for somebody because I know that they want to make some kind of a big splash in the offseason. There's all kinds of like pretty much every um, every big star who is either on the move through free agency or is discussed in trade. Everyone's like, well, of course, they're going to go to the Spurs. <laughs> That's where they're going to end up. So I think what happened is that the. Um, you know, because the Spurs are looking to make room to bring in somebody, people looked at LaMarcus Aldridge's big contract, and that became something that could really help them in terms of making the economics of a trade work. And so then suddenly it became LaMarcus Aldridge, you know, is going to leave. He wants out or the Spurs want to get rid of him. And, you know, possibly that was amplified um, by the you know the hard feelings between portland and lamarcus when he left and that made a really interesting and compelling story and people picked it up and ran with it yeah i mean who knows what's gonna happen i mean and i honestly i don't think the door is totally shut on him coming back either i just don't think it's necessarily that likely but if it happened i wouldn't say oh that was impossible i can't believe that happened i i think anything's possible really but right anyway we're we're chatting chatting about so many things and i know we want to get to some other uh, players. The other big rumor thing was Paul George. What do you think about this? All these rumors about Paul George being moved so that they don't have to just completely lose out when he becomes a free agent and get nothing in return. Okay, I have a, I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is something that I've been thinking about a lot, especially over the last year, and that is um, whether or not it's really that bad of a thing when a player's contract ends and they leave. Like I think everyone talks a lot about they can't let him go without getting anything in return and the thing is is when somebody leaves then you have all that money freed up that you can spend however you want and you're not beholden to like you know work out and figure out a trade you can go uh find somebody else to bring in i just don't think letting somebody leave without um a trade is that terrible of a thing Um, except for then you're relying on only your pull and influence to try and get a big hitter to you that's true a trade forces a player to come to you yeah that's true you know i mean point a here is the portland trailblazers we can't ever entice any big names so yeah uh, this is the whole small market team thing yeah, so I mean, there's well, the fact that we haven't won a championship or been right. a real contender a since 1970 yeah. or since the 90s, I guess we were contenders in the 90s for sure. But anyway, um, I think Paul George though really has, um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of really great discussion about what might happen with him, and my I think it would be really fun. I have no uh, idea if this would be this would happen. 
but I think it would be great if the Cavs were all in, giving it one more shot and doing everything they could to get Paul George. And because I think he would be a really nice fit. I mean, obviously, I think there's general agreement that he'd be a really nice fit anywhere. Um, but I think everybody would love to see the Cavs come back and give the team from the Bay Area a real honest to God, you know, fight down to the wire challenge next year in the finals. And I think Paul George could, could take it to that. So I think it'd be really fun. Get Paul, like just, even though you might not get him because everybody thinks he wants to go to Los Angeles, go all in on getting Paul George to the Cavs. I think I'm, I'm all for that. And I'm kind of hoping that would happen, but he's been associated with like everybody. (laughs) I like the Cavs idea just because I like the Cavs. Um, And I could see the clips happening, especially if Chris Paul walks and they, they can afford it. Um, but I like the idea that I've seen thrown out there of him going to Boston. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think Boston is such an interesting team and they've kind of come out of nowhere after not being a contender for a long time. I think they're just missing a key piece to catapult them deeper into the playoffs. And if you're watching two really creative players like Paul George and Isaiah Thomas go at it together, like such offensive powerhouses, I think that would be so fun to watch. He's just very, um, you know that I love Paul George. He's Mm -hmm. one of my favorite players. And what I love about him is he's so technical. He's so precise. He's so deadly. And I think you would really like learning about him as a player because he learned everything he knows from his older sister who used to kick his bum playing in playing 21 in the, in the driveway. And um, so he's got an interesting backstory as a kid. But he's a great perimeter defender because of that length and speed and toughness. And so I think he fits in with the pace and the style of Boston basketball. And he also has a like, nice range. So he would fit in well with their propensity to shoot from the perimeter. And he's just efficient in shooting in general. So I think he would – I think he'd have fun there. I think he would like the mentality there. I think he would like his teammates there and – um with him and Thomas both on the perimeter being such deadly shooters from out there, you know, you get double teamed. One of the others is likely to be open and you just kind of have all these additional options. So I think it would be cool if he went to Boston. I I like, I do like his, his fit with the players there. I just think in terms of, I think Boston has a longer, um, has a better potential like five years out than the Cavs do. I feel like the window is closing and closing super fast on the Cavs. So they might as well just go all in for, for this last thing. Whereas if Boston gets him, then they're going to have to figure out how to keep him. And he's already said he wants to go to Los Angeles. So I think it's more likely that I don't, I don't think Danny, like, I think, you know, you know, Danny Ainge, he wants to have every draft pick for the 2020 draft if he possibly can. (laughs) So I don't see it fitting into his, I don't see it fitting into Danny Ainge's plans as well, but I, I can see, I can really picture um, the vision that you can see of, of him offensively. And he's an actual bona fide three and D guy. Like a lot of people are like three and D guys are rare. Don't you think? Yeah. They're super rare. And people are like, Bring what is you need to go Wesley out and get a 3 and D guy? Like, it's so easy. Like, Bring you can just, like... Wesley Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can go to the pizza store and order a 3 and D guy. I mean, they're just... There's not that many of them. And, and he really is one of them. I wish, I wish Portland was in the discussion for him because... And I know they kind of have been a little bit, but I, I don't think it's super likely, but... Boy, boy, do I love him. But you've brought up maybe him going to L.A. Um, a couple of times. So that kind of brings to light a few of the free agency mm-hmm. upcomings. Like oh, Chris, it's coming. It's like Chris crazy Paul. Time. I mean, I, I kind of want to talk about Chris Paul. You're talking about one of the greatest point guards of all time, in my opinion. And he's been in the league for 12 years and never even been to the conference finals. I mean, a nine-time All-Star never being to the conference finals. He's so, got to go. So he's got to be I know, somewhere. but people keep saying that he's not going to. And I think, you know, I think that's just as likely as him leaving. I think it's 50-50 because I can understand 
but the mentality of I've put so much into this team. I have been here through everything that this team has been through. And I have, I've put so much into them over the last six years that do I really want to walk away or do I want to stick it out and see them succeed? And, you know, they can pay him more than anyone else. They can give him a longer contract than anyone else. It's his home. And athletes really have a sense of loyalty and pride. So, of course, I could see him staying there. But you know what I really would like? I would really like the Spurs for him. Uh Uh-huh. Because Tony Parker ain't what he used to be. Yada, yada. Like, let's get over the Tony Parker thing. Chris Paul is a few years younger. He is phenomenal on both ends of the floor. And again, known as one of the greatest point guards in NBA history when you're looking at individual accomplishments, not team, obviously, because this team hasn't done that well with him. Um, But the Spurs are all about order and precision and things working like clockwork. And that is Chris Paul to a T. Like, and imagine if they worked it out and they kept Aldridge. Think about Aldridge, Chris Paul, and Kawhi Leonard on the floor. Think about that. It's the epitome of the heart eyes emoji. (laughs) That's the hard eyes emoji right there. Well, yeah, I, you know how I feel about the Spurs. I usually just go, ugh, and I roll my eyes. But this year, the, this is how much I dislike the team from the Bay Area. (laughs) Like the Spurs have been a team that have just gotten under my skin for years because the Spurs take everything I love. Everything I love eventually ends up with the Spurs, and I fully blame them for it. The Spurs, it's like that Dolly Parton song, Jolene. You know, Jolene, please mm-hmm. don't take my man. Mm-hmm. The Spurs are my Jolene. They took LaMarcus Aldridge. They took Andre Miller. They took Patty Mills. You know, they took everybody that I love, right? Okay, so as- but Portland could have had P- Patty Mills back, and they said no. Well, everybody I love ended up with the Spurs, okay? So... Uh, asking me to root for the Spurs is like asking me to like be friends with the girl who stole my last three boyfriends. I mean, it's just, it's just not cool. That's how much that's, that's how I feel about the Spurs, but the team from the Bay area bothers me so much that I am all in on the Spurs now. (laughs) (laughs) I want them to win it. I am go Spurs go. Well, and see, the Spurs are, the, and they have been for quite some time. They're my second favorite team. And so, and that just comes from me growing up and watching Tim Duncan and uh, David Robinson. So to me, I've I just, never liked I think them because they're awesome. always the prettiest girl in the class that everybody wants, or they're always the smartest kid in the class that everybody yeah. knew was going to go to MIT on a scholarship and was going to like make a ton of money and be super successful. And I always sat there <laughs> just like, ugh. But I am all in on them this year. Awesome. Me what do you too. think Blake Griffin's going to do? Speaking of the Clippers. Um, yeah, I think that Blake Griffin, I listen, picture this in your mind. Okay. Blake Griffin, Russell Westbrook. Ooh. I mean, they need someone to replace Durant in some sort of a way, right? Huh? Interesting. Griffin can score alongside someone like Westbrook with ease. Like Westbrook But will he can, get the ball enough? Westbrook can feed him. Westbrook is capable of not being the only person doing he anything just needs on the somebody floor. Somebody who he know he can trust. That's the big thing about Westbrook. He needs to have somebody he can trust. Yeah. So huh. I, that's and to be honest, that's kind of my only opinion on it on on the matter. And we're going pretty long on this. So it's probably good. Cause I can be real long winded. So yeah. that's, that's my number. Where do you think he should go? You know, I have no idea. I can't get past. I'm just thinking about like my, for me, I'm interested in where everyone is going to be holding their meetings. <laughs> <laughs> you know how last year, um, what's his nose? Kevin Durant was like out in the Hamptons and the Island in the Hamptons. I'm just trying to figure out where everybody's going to have their, their meetings this year. I think Blake Griffin's meetings are going to be at the improv and he's going to be like down in Los Angeles. He's going to invite all the teams to come to the improv and ask them to stand up and do like a set and then he'll like rate how good they are on the sets and then he'll decide if he wants to join their team or not. And that sounds exactly like Blake Griffin. He's so hilarious. I love him. I love I love Blake Griffin. Okay, real quick, what do you think is going to happen with Gordon Hayward? 
Um, well, I think he's going to have his meetings at Park City. And I, <laughs> I, I hope he stays in Utah. I really like what Utah has going on. And I think that uh, him, removing him will set them back. And I would really like for him to stay. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about him going to Boston. And I think that he would be a big fit there. And it would be nice for us because it would get him out of the West. But um, I think he's going to stay in Utah. Me too. I don't think he's going to give up a longer contract and more money and playing alongside George Hill and Rudy Gobert very easily. But I have heard some rumblings about him going to the Heat. And I I mean, playing alongside Hassan Whiteside, I mean, I feel like a player like Gordon Hayward would consider that to be a a pretty fun scenario. Um, He adds a lot to the offensive end. And so having white side on the defense event like that's a pretty dynamic that's a that's a pretty good setup there but yeah in my opinion I think he'll probably end up staying in Utah in any case it'll be really fascinating to find out what does happen we are just days away from free agency there's I wonder if there'll be a few more uh, trades before free agency really kicks in But this is the time of year where you just never know what's going to happen. You stay glued to your phone. (laughs) This is the time of year that things like Jimmy Butler going to Minnesota for freaking Zach Levine happen. Oh, yeah. I am shocked. First of all, Zach Levine is not near the player that Jimmy Butler is. Like, I don't, I don't consider what happened with that trade and even trade at all. I think the Bulls, maybe the Bulls have some sort of long-term plan that the rest of us just can't see right now. But in the immediate vision, I, I do not understand what happened. I don't. I don't at all. And I am high on Jimmy Butler. So maybe I'm just too high on Jimmy Butler. But I think he is so incredible And I've never liked Zach Levine. I don't like his attitude. I don't like his style. I don't like... You don't like his dunks? I don't like... I mean, maybe... Fine. If you want to twist my arm, I'll say I like his dunks. But I I just don't like him really as a player. And I just don't see the type of production coming out of him the way that it, it does from Jimmy Butler. And I know he's younger and he needs to develop a little bit more and Jimmy's had some more time. But I just, Jimmy Buckets, man. Mm-hmm. Oof. I mean, good for Minnesota. They need something. Don't they have the longest, current longest streak without going to the playoffs? So, I mean, maybe Jimmy Butler's the turnaround for that. But I, I just, I don't like it at all. And I will admit that some of that might just be irrational emotion because I dislike Zach Levine so much. Well, you're not alone in thinking that it was a really lopsided trade. But here's what I've been thinking. It seems to me there are so many lopsided trades that we keep talking about how one team got completely robbed. Like, you know, for example, the trade between Sacramento and the New Orleans Pelicans that involved Boogie. Like people are just scratching their heads like, how could that be possible? And I think there's something going on. I think there's some kind of a sea change going on in the front offices precipitated by the jump in the... um the jump in the salary cap where we're going to see a lot more of these um, trades that we see from the outside as really uneven. And I think at some point it's going to become more clear why they're becoming, um, why they're happening. Cause I just, I I feel like this is not going to be the last one where we just go, Oh my God, are you kidding me? I think there's something that we don't know. And it has to do with economics and um, something that the, the, um, the general managers are figuring out they have to do. I don't know what it is yet. I've been tr- chatting with a bunch of the guys on Blazer's Edge to try to get some insight from them into what could possibly be going on. They think I'm out of my mind and they don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it wouldn't be I the guess, first time. <laughs> I, I guess we just have to sit back and watch and see. I mean, we're not the GMs and I mean, probably for good reason, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but right, there's, yeah. you know, I, I really, I think I have a little more faith in, in GMs than a lot of people do. Um, 
but you know, whatever. And I just want to give a shout out to Eric Griffith, who always answers my CBA questions like right away, like with infinite, infinite patience. <laughs> He's, it's like having my own personal like Larry Coon, the guy who knows all about the CBA. It's like having, you know, a go to one that like I know I can get a really straightforward um, answer from quickly. What so, a great resource. He really go, is. Everybody should get on blazersedge.com and read all of the articles by, we have many authors. There's a new column by Brian Freeman that he's been putting out that talks about the um, basketball through the lens of somebody who was a, oh, he played overseas. Super interesting work on there. So if people haven't read any of those uh, articles or features that Brian has been writing, I would highly recommend going there. Follow David McKay because he's got all kinds of news coming out all the time. We got some new writers that are putting out some really interesting um, analysis. So uh, if you like learning about the Blazers and what they're up to, blazersedge.com is where you will find all that good stuff. If you like this podcast, you can subscribe to the podcast uh, on Stitcher and iTunes. Let's see. Anything else we need to add, Joe? I don't think so. I think you covered it, but it was a pleasure to catch up with you. It's been a while, and thank you for getting me up to speed. You're always so diligent in all of your hard work and research. It's just, you definitely pull the weight here between us. So I appreciate that. And thank you for talking ball with me. Yeah, it was great to talk to you, Joe. Have fun in Alaska. And uh, we will talk again later after free agency. Sounds good.